Thank you, Reem, for your kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Chopra, for being here and being part of Dubai's World Government Summit. And welcome to all the listeners tuning in. I'm sure you're all excited about our guest today. I personally have read many of Dr. Chopra's books and have participated in Dr. Chopra's 21-day meditation challenge. The last one I did was in March of this year. Although Dr. Chopra needs no introduction, I would like to highlight again a few points in his amazing bio. Dr. Chopra is a world pioneer in integrative medicine and personal transformation. He is also a clinical professor of medicine at University of California, San Diego, an adjunct professor of executive programs at Kellogg School of Management in Northwestern University and Columbia Business School. Dr. Chopra has also authored more than 85 books translated into 45 languages. I think this knowledge of personal transformation of health and business is what makes Dr. Chopra's insights in today's talk very valuable for all of us, either as individuals, businesses, or governments. I know that Dr. Chopra has visited Dubai before, and he would have been with us right now if it weren't for the changing circumstances that we all find ourselves in. And this summit has changed. It has become virtual. And so too, perhaps we have changed, again, as individuals, as businesses, and as humans. Even though Dr. Chopra is in the US and I am in Dubai and our listeners are from all over the globe, I really feel that this pandemic has made us more connected as humans. I personally feel more connected to everyone all over the world. Uh, although physically, I am very isolated, even from my nearest and dearest. So without further delay, this might be a good time to hand over the platform to Dr. Chopra for his insights and thoughts in helping us navigate and understand the why and the what next when it comes to COVID-19. Welcome, Dr. Chopra. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamdi. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share some insights with you and the world government in this forum that is being hosted from Dubai. So I'd like to start uh, just by saying that uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic is the biggest opportunity for humanity for a reset, also to reinvent our lives, to reinvent our bodies, to resurrect our souls, to reimagine the future of not only humanity, but the planet. And so before I go, since you're a physician, I'm a physician and everybody else, there are many physicians there. I just want to address COVID-19 before we go into the bigger implications. So COVID-19 is so-called because it's a 2019 mutation of the coronavirus. The coronavirus itself has existed for millions of years. So this is the latest mutation. Now, when you look at mutations, uh, geneticists, when they look at mutations, they'll tell you that there are certain mutations that we don't have an explanation for. Obviously, there is an explanation always. We don't know it. So these are de novo mutations, spontaneous mutations. We have no idea where they occur. But most mutations, 90% or more, are linked to some kind of stress in what is called the environment. Okay, the environment today is what we call a biosphere, the ecosystem of existence. And when I say existence, I don't mean just human existence, but all existence, every life form, plants, trees, bacteria, uh, bacteriophages, viruses, fungi. This is the entangled microbiome of our planet, which is expressing itself as biological organisms who are experiencing what we call the physical universe. So there's direct link between the entangled microbiome of existence and what is happening in the world right now. If we buy this argument, then you can see that the ecosystem is inflamed, climate change, war, terrorism, extinction of species, 
poison in the food chain in the form of inflammatory products like antibiotics and hormones and actually chemicals that are inflammatory. They're part of our food chain now. 30% of the microbiome has disappeared in the world, especially in urban uh, cities. So we are seeing inflammation in the biosphere. We know from other studies that COVID-19 is attacking people who are elderly, who have chronic disease, like diabetes, very common all over the world, which the same risk factors as every other disease, heart disease, coronary artery disease, hypertension, autoimmune illnesses, cancer. All these are connected to inflammation, chronic inflammation. There's a lot of data, and I'm happy to share it with everyone, uh, that is available that shows that COVID-19 attacks people who have chronic inflammation, but also have mental challenges like anxiety and depression. Sometimes the anxiety and depression is very low grade, but it's there. So low grade anxiety, low grade depression, and chronic inflammation are risk factors for the elderly. But right now, what is also happening, young people are getting the infection, and some of them are going on respirators and dying. And all that we have seen right now in our literature and our library searches shows that people who get acutely sick on top of chronic inflammation, they also have acute inflammation. They have what is called a COVID storm, a cytokine storm, easily measurable through biological markers, cytokines. And they are the ones who are getting sick. Now, our studies show that you can decrease the storm through various practices, whether it's breathing, mindfulness, meditation, and many, many other mind-body interventions. But you can also decrease the COVID storm by, you know, what we might talk about later, the six pillars or seven pillars of well-being. You can decrease the COVID storm and therefore decrease the likelihood of getting sick, even if you have the infection. So obviously we have to observe all the, all the precautions, physical distancing, wearing masks, etc. But we need to address a bigger problem, which is a simultaneous pandemic, which is this pandemic of stress, which is causing sympathetic overdrive. And we have to counter it with every measure possible, and that would be a much more effective treatment than just coming up with a vaccine. Because even the vaccine will have maybe a year or two years of effectiveness, and if the ecosystem remains inflamed, then there will be further mutations. So the vaccine is not the answer. It's a temporary solution. Long-term solution is to look holistically at what's causing a distressed ecosystem and inflammation of the entangled microbiome. So having said this, we now look at the bigger picture, social injustice, economic injustice, racial injustice, war, terrorism, poison in the food chain, climate change, mass migrations, extreme nationalism, selfish interests. It's obvious right now that we need a creative solution to the COVID pandemic. And one of the problems I have with all the literature I see is we use violent metaphors, war on drugs, war on poverty, war on uh, social injustice, war on whatever, but that's an oxymoron. There's no violent solution to any problem, including COVID, war on COVID. We need creative solutions. And creative solutions come when there is what is called emergence. And right now, we are poised for emergence for various reasons, but also because of technology. We are poised for what is called emergence. When you look at social scientists talking about emergence, they say emergence happens when there is maximum diversity of opinion, talent, and training. So let's say we had an ecosystem of philosophers, scientists, uh, technologists, poets, artists, entertainers, musicians, but also educational experts, maximum diversity of talent, opinion. 
open, transparent system, second criteria for emergence, open to feedback, third criteria. Fourth, shared vision. So we can have a shared vision. The World Government Summit is a shared vision because you wouldn't be doing this otherwise. The shared vision, in my opinion, is a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful planet. Once again, the shared vision, in my opinion, is a more peaceful, just, sustainable, and healthier, and joyful planet. Joy. There's no joy. You, I can't see any public smiling or cracking a joke or laughing or having a good time. They have exchanged headaches for fun. Uh, humanity is not having fun, and, but if the COVID is giving us a little hint. COVID pandemic says humans, now that you're in your cages, please reinvent the world and we will help you. The ecosystem is already uh, repairing itself. We now know, by the way, that climate change is reversible. We fish are returning to dead lakes. Even the canals of Venice have fish today. Um, people can see the Himalayas from 500 miles away. People are breathing in Bangalore, which is one of the most polluted cities in the world. You can see the stars at night, even in New Delhi. Birds are singing. The bees have come back. You know, 90% of nutrition in this world is bees. And they were disappearing. They're coming back. So nature is telling us, the planet is telling us, when you come back, don't be so arrogant. Life is not only about humans. Life is the entangled microbiome or genetic information of this planet. And if you destroy that, then you might go all the way to extinction. We are risking our extinction right now with all the things we have, including mechanized death and nuclear weapons and biohacking and you know, all the things you see on the news. It's headed for extinction. Yet we have the technologies today to repair everything. What we're being told is climate change is reversible. What we're also being told is an oil-free economy is possible. We are being told that right now. When the price of oil falls to less than zero, something is going on, okay? So we are getting all the hints right now that we need to repair the inflammation of existence. And that inflammation is coded in our entangled microbiome or planetary microbiome, which we need to fix and we can fix it. So shared vision, emotional and spiritual bonding, total transparency, an open ecosystem of opinion, maximum diversity, and we have a solution, a global solution. The world government could even host this. You can have online and offline communities just doing this, addressing climate change, addressing mass migrations, addressing conflict resolution, addressing nutrition, addressing everything, social injustice. If we have an open community, global, online and offline, with that shared vision and the diversity of talent, opinion, and actually amazing genius of humans who have invented this technology where we are sitting in different places and we can all communicate. Yes, social distancing right now is physical social distancing. But actually, I have never been more intimate with the world since this has happened. And I'm not socially distanced. We are all just physically distanced. And if we behave ourselves, we can go back to physical distance. We can get rid of that too. So right now, this is what we need. The science of emergence. And emergence cannot happen from extreme nationalism. It cannot happen from defensive ideologies, whether they are religious or political or social or financial. Right now, we need to fix life on this planet. If we fix life on this planet, we can all collectively dream and actualize that dream for a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful planet. Now, if I ask someone anywhere in the world, Palestine, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Israel, anywhere, do you want 
a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world for yourself, for your children, and for your grandchildren, who would say no? Who would say no? I think we have to get rid of the old paradigm altogether. Right now, there is distributed leadership emerging in the world, distributed economies. People are talking about cryptocurrencies. I think everything is in, in uh, uncertainty now, including economic structures like Wall Street. Everything is in, is in question right now. This is a sign of a major paradigm shift if we take the opportunity. But if we don't, then we are looking forward to extinction. The last extinction was 65 million years ago when a, uh, when a meteorite fell on planet Earth, caused the equivalent of a nuclear explosion. And dinosaurs were wiped out in less than one hour. We face the same catastrophe right now. We have the capacity to destroy the world 20 times over that nuclear explosion, the equivalent of the nuclear explosion that occurred 65 million years ago. Let's not do it. We, let's not be on a collective suicide mission. Today we need emergence. We need a collective shared vision. We need to come together. We need exactly what you're talking about, a world government summit that begins this conversation. And then the conversation is not enough because the conversation has to actualize into solid plans which I call smart goals. Stretch more than you can reach. Make everything measurable. Make sure that we all are on the same frequency, shared vision, agree on that. Make a record of your progress systemically every day. And finally, set a time limit. And if we can set that time limit together, five years, to resurrect, repair, renew, and reinvent and reimagine the world, then I think we can do it. I think we can do it. The key here is taking care of our own selves. So I have a mantra that I use every day before I start my day. And it has four intentions, joyful energetic body, joyful energetic body, loving compassionate heart, a clear reflective mind, and lightness of being. If we can, each of us, have these four intentions and allow every choice we make to reinforce these four intentions that I just mentioned, and we can create a critical mass of people that want that, I think we'll see a new birth of a new civilization. And if you don't, then good luck. So <laughs> I will stop here. Uh, I think I had uh, 20 minutes or so, maybe I've gone overboard, but I'm happy to uh, uh, answer questions, engage with you, anything that you want. I, I still have a few uh, minutes if you want, I can continue, but personal transformation and social transformation go together. There's no social transformation in the absence of personal transformation because society is built by people, okay? So first thing is personal transformation. How can we achieve a more joyful, energetic body, a more loving, compassionate heart, a more reflective, alert, creative mind, not a warring mind, and lightness of being, or flow, or transcendence, or peak experiences. This is what all the athletes know about, all the you know, musicians know about, all the poets, all the spiritual seekers know that there are moments of peak joy and experience when the ego is out of the way. When the ego is out of the way, when there's no resistance, when there is total flow, there's no anticipation, just that shared vision, we can resurrect our souls and reinvent the world and reimagine reality. So personal transformation leading to social transformation. In Mahatma Gandhi's words, you have to be the change that you want to see in the world. Otherwise, there's no change in the world. The world is as we are, and that critical mass is needed right now. Personal transformation, social transformation, planetary transformation. That's the sequence, and the science is there. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Chopra. The, you touched upon 
quite a few interesting topics that I'd like to go uh, and maybe explore further. But I'd just like to tell our audience that if you have any questions, please do type them in and tell us where you are from um, so we can mention it. Now, you talked about personal transformation and I loved, you thought you had a few minutes and maybe I wanna go a little bit further on that because a lot of people think that transformation has to be at the government level and it has nothing to do with them and they feel they're unempowered. But I just wanna bring about maybe the example of COVID that it wasn't the governments who could stop it. It was each individual doing the, his or her job, which was social distancing, washing your hands, wearing a mask and practicing, you know, uh, or, or, or being safe for their health and the health of others. So, you know, what about, you said there is a personal transformation that has to happen also. And let's start, you know, quickly because, uh, or, or simply with ourselves. What is the first step we need to take? How can we be less stressed, less judgmental? Is it by being grateful and loving people, even if it means smiling at everyone and saying hello? You know, is that a good start? How can we achieve that in, in, in defined steps? So uh, you raised something very important and I, I'll just share with you what I do. So, you know, in addition to the four intentions that I introduce, I ask four questions of myself every day. The first question is, what do I want? What do I really want for my family, for my friends, for my community, for my country and for my world? That's the first question I ask. And then I wait for a response. I don't immediately have an answer. There's a response can be a sensation, an image, a feeling, a thought, but there's always a response to that question. What do we want? Number one. Number two, what is our purpose? You know, ask that. What is my purpose? What is the purpose of existence? What is the purpose of humanity? Why are we here? Okay, and you will all get, everybody gets their own answer, which is uniquely their own answer. It's not my answer, it's not yours. So that's um, the second question. What is our purpose? Okay. The third question, who are we? Are we just, am I just, are you just an Arab? Am I just uh, Indian? Am I just a Caucasian, African American? What's beneath the skin? Okay, now, by the way, genetically, we know that 99.999% of us, in fact, 100% of us are genetically from Africa. Okay, whether you're Arab or Caucasian, that's epigenetic mod modulation. So who are we beneath the surface of our skin? Okay, and final question, which you brought up, what are we grateful for? As soon as you ask the question, what am I grateful for? And the response comes, Inflammatory markers go down, gene activity is changed, and your body feels good. Just asking the question. Now, if you ask these questions and have the right intentions, you start the journey. You don't force yourself to be kind. Don't force yourself to be loving. That's our nature, okay? But we are distracted. And if you take a little time to reflect, and this is what is called reflective meditation. There are many kinds of meditation. Uh, mindful awareness of body, mindful awareness of the senses, mindful awareness of relationship, mindful awareness of existence, mindful awareness of the ecosystem, mindful awareness of awareness itself. But just being grateful starts it all. And since you raised 21 day meditation, we have right now 21 day meditation, body, mind and spirit. All you have to do is go to our website, Chopra.com. It's free, it's available to the world, and uh, this is one way to start. I actually did that, and I did the one um, of abundance. Um, and it's funny you mention, um, what are we here for? I had no clarity. Everyone thinks you graduate college, and you know exactly what you want to do with your life, and why you were put on this planet. I got clarity when I was 40. So for everyone who, just like Dr. Chopra said, ask the question, and if the answer doesn't come, it wasn't meant to come at that particular time. Now we have a question. I do want to make one comment here. Most people think they're here to make a living. 
<laughs> and they, they, they think they are here to make a living and they sacrifice life to make a living. They never enjoy life. They're only making a living. Yeah, that's true. And, 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 and I always say, enjoy the journey. Enjoy that's what right. life gets you or gives you at that particular moment. We have a wonderful question from India. Can we touch upon the impact of the pandemic on children and what we can do to perhaps minimize its negative effects on them? The children are the future. There are going to be the future decision makers. Um, and I think that there might be an impact if we don't maybe, maybe talk to our children. What should we do for the children, because we know that children also experience stress, especially with all the media noise. We don't know what they're hearing, what they're not, and what they're believing. So up to the age of five years, children mirror their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something called mirror neurons. And what they're looking at is eye movements, um, uh, facial expressions, tone of voice, gestures, body language. Mm -hmm. And if the body language, every, everything I've said, reflects that stress, then children get stressed and there's inflammation in their body. What do children like to do more than anything else? Play. So for children, the best treatment right now, maximize play and storytelling. You know, I, have, uh, I came across a very interesting story recently from a young woman in Saudi, who's a friend of mine, Lina. And she read up long time ago, a story of the Queen Zubaida, who lived at the time of Harun al Rashid. And she was an engineer. She created uh, what do you call wells all along the route yeah. from, uh, from Baghdad to Mecca and saved millions of lives. And nobody knows about her uh, generally. But if you hear the story, and uh, Lena told this story to young girls, their whole self-esteem shifted because they wanted to be like Queen Zubaida. So for my friend who's asking this question from India, there's so many beautiful stories in the spiritual literature. And why don't you uh, start telling those stories of heroism, of, of, uh, of superheroes? and play with them and sing to them and dance with them and share poetry with them and you will decrease their stress. Now, if they're over five years, then you can introduce some movement, this and that. But remember, children don't listen to your lectures. They watch you. I agree. I just, we have a few questions about the violence, the, the anger, the collective anger. And I liked what you said. We're using violent metaphors. Just today, uh, or, or two days ago, when we were talking about this uh, summit, they were asking me, oh, what are we going to do about this crisis? And I said, no, no, no. First of all, I don't call it a crisis. You know, uh, it really is important that we are careful with the words we choose. Another thing is resilience. Everyone thinks that this has nothing to do with me or it's beyond what I can do. I am a delicate person and I don't have resilience. And I think in integrative medicine, because I'm an integrative practitioner, so are you, we know what resilience is and it's not inborn, is it? The strength that you have to be flexible, to cope with problems and setbacks are learned and they're not inborn. Um, and this is something that you touched upon also when you talked, but how can we build resilience? So resilience or adaptation is a, is a part of our evolution. Okay, those that are resilient and those that adapt survive, those that don't become extinct. So it's a very important point, this resilience point. Resilience comes when you question your habitual certainties and you question your habitual responses. To me, there's only one little thing you can do to adapt, to increase resilience. Press the pause button before you respond to anything. So before you react to anything, press the pause button and observe your reaction to react. Just that, observe your reaction to react. That's the highest intelligence to observe yourself without judgment and just in that, you begin the journey to resilience. Don't be, a, don't be a biological robot that's triggered by people and circumstance into predictable outcomes. That's what the world is doing right now. And what is it doing? It's recycling panic. 
-hmm. So you can personally bypass that by just observing your reaction to react. And before you respond, ask yourself, is this response going to make me, make me happier? That's the, you know, before I make a choice, I ask myself, is this going to increase the happiness quotient for me and the world? And if the answer is yes, you make a choice. If the answer is no, you don't make the choice. We have another interesting question from the audience. And the question is, there's been so much media noise during this pandemic. How can we use media platforms responsibly during this time? How can we gain knowledge but not be overwhelmed with negativity? Any tips? Now, personally, Dr. Chopra, I've been tuning out. I mean, I've been, in the, at the start of COVID, I've been watching the news every single day. And then I just tuned out because it's all, it's not giving me useful information, i.e., what can we do to help negate the risks? What can we do to help, um, you know, keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. So what can we do with the media noise out there? How can we know information without it being overwhelming for us? So, you know, I don't know about the rest of the world, although I do to some extent, but the U.S. media right now is not even news. It's opinion. So, you know, you don't listen to news. You, depending on which channel you're watching, you're getting their ideological opinion. Yeah. And to some extent, that's happening all over the world. So news is no longer really neutral news. It's everything is an opinion. At the same time, you need to know what's going on. You need to know what's going on. So personally, I watch the news twice, in the morning and at night. But I don't buy into everything that is being said. I question the certainty with which that is said. The more certainty with that which it is said, it means it's, it's an ideological opinion rather than fact. Because the facts at the moment are actually very interesting. The facts are showing we can cut down inflammation, we can resurrect the climate, and on and on. We can create new currencies, new trade, trade uh, uh, habits, uh, new social media system. Right now, we're doing that. We're creating our own news, right? We're creating our own news. So more that happens, more that is distributed, and there will be a balance at some time between the corporate world, the governments, and the distributed ecosystem of leaders across the world. I, I like to use the word uh, starfish model of leadership instead of spider model. So if you squash the head of a spider, the whole organism dies. A starfish has six limbs. You cut one, it grows two. If you cut all six, it grows 36 limbs. So it's a distributed model as well as there's a central point, which could be a government, a business, an organization. When the, then the leadership becomes distributed for special types of needs. That will be the future and that will bypass or maybe integrate what we call news. Okay, I have another question now, and it's getting more medical and more technical here. You mentioned that um, well-being helps decrease the cyto uh, cytokine storm that happens because it's not the actual virus that kills us, it's the inflammatory response or the exaggerated inflammatory response that happens in the lungs or, or in the lungs for, for COVID-19 that actually um, leads to the death. So, isn't it funny that these are what has been given by my integrative medical practitioners and uh, it is get enough sleep. And you're like, okay, manage stress, right? Eat well, which is basically respecting the environment and you know, maybe targeted supplements. It was funny, I was in the US in March during the start of COVID. And I have a, a colleague of mine who's an immunologist at Yale University. And I, and I asked him, I said, what is the one thing I can do to keep my immunity high? And I honestly thought he'd give me some supplement or some medication. And he says, meditation. And I said, yeah, I know. And he goes, meditation. Study after study after study shows that meditation helps your immunity. I think just like there's inflammation in the environment, we ourselves, we've led a very toxic life, a very inflamed life. And I just wanna also mention 
we, you were talking about the six components of well-being. Um, I'm going to mention them just so our audience knows, and maybe you can go through one or two and, and, and um, teach people maybe how to become more or, or how to get well-being, more well-being into their life. The six key components are self-acceptance, purpose in life, environmental mastery, i.e. how well one manages life situations, positive relationships, personal growth, and autonomy. Now, we were, talking, we were talking about all of us together. What, how do we become, a, you know, where's autonomy and where's this shared consciousness? So very interesting questions and we can elaborate on each of these. We could do a whole seminar, but, or a whole workshop. But those six things that you mentioned are of course uh, accelerated if you have good sleep. If you meditate, if you do some exercise, some mind-body coordination with yoga, breathing techniques, uh, healthy relationships, of course, nutrition, which is not poison in the food, that's it. You know, if the food comes from the farm to the table, that's the best food. Uh, repairing your microbiome, decreasing inflammation, self-awareness, all of that is important. You mentioned meditation, so we have now many studies uh, along with uh, places like Harvard and UCSF and Duke University and right here in our backyard scripts with the Nobel laureate Elizabeth Blackburn, where a week of meditation experience um, changed the entire genome activity. So all the genes that were responsible for self-regulation, homeostasis, anti-inflammation, they went up some 17-fold over baseline. The level of telomerase in some people, telomerase is the enzyme that regulates our biological age, went up by 40%. There's no drug that can do that in the world. Okay, All the genes that were responsible for inflammation went down significantly. So meditation helps what we call self-regulation or homeostasis, which is the basis of all healing. Uh, that's why we are so keen on everybody joining the 21-day meditation program um, and distributing it all over the world. But then when you add to that what you said, good nutrition, uh, supplements, depending on your location, if you're, say, in a temperate climate, you need vitamin D, you should take it anyway because it has an anti-inflammatory effect, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of literature on this. And it's now very clear that we can decrease morbidity, decrease mortality with social distancing and everything we've been told about personal hygiene, masks, etc. With all of that and managing our stress and understanding inflammation and the connection between inflammation, stress, depression, anxiety, and disease, we have a holistic way to actually improve our well-being. This is the opportunity. And as you said, meditation is free. You know, it yes. really is. Yes, um, meditation I know, is free. I know that 2016 study, because it was done at the Chopra Center with Harvard, it, I just wanted to also tell the audience that the experienced meditators had a particular shift in their genes related to fighting viral infections. So especially during this time, it's always a good time to start. There's another question from the audience that I think is um, interesting. The pandemic has resulted in people being more alert to certain issues. Example, being more environmentally friendly. It also resulted in people lowering their excessive consumption habits that, may have, that they may have had pre-pandemic. How can we learn to live beyond our wants and live our more purposeful lives? And is it okay to want nice stuff? I mean, you know, now I don't feel like dressing up. I don't want to wear anything. I really don't. But once things go back to normal, whatever normal is, should we feel guilty about it? What are your thoughts? You know, how can we live a better life? So three different responses. Never feel guilty. It's not good for your health, <laughs> number one. Uh, guilt is uh, it's a toxic emotion, period. Um, and of course, don't do anything that would make you want to feel guilty, number one, also. Um, second, I don't like the word environment. It's our extended body. 
the air is our breath, the trees are our lungs. If they didn't breathe, we wouldn't breathe. If we didn't breathe, the trees wouldn't breathe. You put an animal in a vacuum, it dies. You put a plant in a vacuum, it dies. You put them together, they both live. So the air is our breath, the earth is recycling as our body, the rivers and oceans are our circulation, and the atoms in our body are stardust made in the crucible of burning stars in intergalactic regions. We are literally stardust beings, and this schism between body, biological uh, organism, and environment is an artificial subject-object split. It's not real. So once we get rid of this idea that the biosphere and the ecosystem is out there, but also in here, and they're both the same ecosystem, we have a much better chance of actually repairing the ecosystem because your biology is representing the ecosystem that we have at the moment. environment. You have a personal body, you have an extended body, universal body, they're both equally yours. You can't survive without either. Lastly, yes, it's okay to have stuff and gather stuff as long as you're not a hoarder, because hoarders never enjoy their stuff. They just hoard. So enjoy your stuff. And then you'll realize you don't need that much stuff. Perfect. Thank you. I have the, another question from the audience in the U.S. How can leaders help reset their teams post the pandemic? And that's, yeah. It's a very good question. And this is, the, this is what the sciences of great leadership. A great leader knows how to create a great team. A great team has diversity. A great team has maximum diversity of talent, but also of opinion and also of training. So diversity of team, again, shared vision and complementing everyone's strength and you can create a new ecosystem for leadership. Now, the data also shows that the most effective teams are between five and 12. So if you have less than five on your team, it's not that effective. If more than 12 on your team, it becomes cumbersome. So in my leadership training, what I do is I train leaders to have at least five to 12 people in their team. And then each of those to have five to 12 people in their team. So a while ago, I did something with Pepsi or PepsiCo or one of those companies where we actually did distributed training for leadership for 50,000 people, just like this. So I just, that was the question I wanted to ask. It's not just for governments that it's five to 12. It's also for businesses. We can take that yes, same model. Yes. And then they can be distributed, right? Every leader can have their own team. Now, when you were talking about diversity, it also struck me that it's not just something that government and people in business need to listen to. I think as individuals, we need to listen to because we really are living in a council culture society, aren't we? Um, how can we, first of all, let's talk about council culture, but also you said diversity of uh, opinions. Can we agree to disagree? Is that what you're saying? Can we still have different opinions, but respect each other? There are certain rules that if you follow in conflict resolution, you can be as different in your opinion as, one, as you want. Okay, so here are the rules. Treat your adversary or your competitor or your enemy with respect, because if you don't treat them with respect, you've gone. You don't even start the conversation. Two, recognize that there is the perception of injustice on the both sides. Otherwise, there is no conflict. There has to be uh, recognition of injustice on both sides. Third, be willing to forgive and ask for forgiveness. It's a sign of strength. You forgive not because the other person in your mind deserves forgiveness. You forgive because you deserve peace. As long as you don't forgive, you are not going to be peaceful. Four, don't be belligerent. Five, understand the principles of emotional and social intelligence. They are there. What does empathy mean? What does compassion mean? What is a creative solution at the emotional level? Best way to do that is to get to know another person and their life. If I knew where you grew up, who your parents were, what your influences were, you knew where I grew up, what, who my parents, what my influences, my history, my religion, we would have a better conversation, right? So use those principles. They're well known. 
emotional and social intelligence. Six, don't stereotype people, which is what we do all the time, racial profile. Mm -hmm. Seven, understand that in any conflict, there's fear, no matter how strong people act, there's underlying fear. Eight, be ready to find a creative solution which is economic for both parties. Okay, if I was handling the conflict in India and Pakistan, I would tell India, Pakistan, China, and Kashmir to create the best ski resort in the world out there in the Himalayas and everybody benefits. So there are always mutual win-win situations. If we follow these principles, really, and uh, finally, don't prove somebody wrong. You lose them. As soon as you say they're wrong, you lose them. Okay? Even if you th think they're wrong, that's your opinion. So give up being right and you will ask them very simple questions. What are you observing? What are you feeling? What do you need? How can I help you? And your enemy, your competitor will become your friend instantly. I, it really um, resonated with me when you said if we know, knew about each other, we wouldn't, we, you know, we'd be friends even if we disagreed. And it's about respect. It really is. Whenever I, I know someone, I always say, you're very welcome to come to my house. I'll cook some Imarati food for you. And it, and it goes for you as well, Dr. Chopra. I find that when I travel, I can find culture and celebrate with my friends, even if it's differing races and religions, because once there's respect, once there's, once there's understanding and participation, you really can't hate that person, can you? It's, 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 it, they become like a, a brother and, and a sister and, and family to you. Look at your own family. Look at your own family. If you treat your children with the disrespect, they won't respect you, right? If you treat your husband with disrespect, they won't respect you. So, you know, that principle extends everywhere. That's the number one thing that we need to pay attention to, to get to know, know each other respectfully. I agree. Then you were talking about the fact that there, you know, post uh, or before COVID uh, started, there was no joy. And personally, I was working so hard I felt that COVID was almost like a vacation. I was having breakfast with my children and husband, lunch with my uh, children and husband, and, and dinner. That hasn't happened in quite a while without me feeling guilty. Like I should be somewhere else, or I should be working, or I should be working on this. Because they make you feel like if you're not working all the time, you're lazy and you're, you're, you're not pr a productive unit. But I also realize I have to work on my happiness. It just doesn't, you know, it just, we don't wake up happy. Sometimes we have to work on happiness. Now, meditation helps. Feeling grateful helps. Do you have any other tips on how our audience can work on their happiness and becoming more joyful or having more joy in their lives? By the way, my, my experience is also joyful. Every day I celebrate existence and the awareness of existence. What the world is going through is grief right now. But at certain point, when you accept what's happening, you find meaning and purpose. And when you find meaning and purpose, you find joy. Now, there is something called the happiness formula that social scientists talk about. And here it is. H is equal to S plus C plus V. So H stands for happiness. S stands for set point in the brain. Are you looking at the situation as a problem or as an opportunity? So those who look at the situation as a problem are unhappy. Those who look at it as an opportunity are happy. And this is 50% of our daily happiness experience is just the set point. So H is equal to S plus C. C stands for conditions of living, which is basically material things, money, shopping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, but that adds only 10 to 12% of happiness to your daily quotient of happiness, according to the scientific studies, which are, by the way, validated by other people. The last part of the formula, H is equal to S plus C plus V, is the voluntary choices that you make every day. So there are two kinds of choices we make every day. One, personal pleasure, shopping, some people, alcohol, entertainment, whatever. And then there's another choice we can make, which is fulfillment. Fulfillment means what brings joy through relationship. The fastest way, by the way, to be happy is to make somebody else happy. And you need to 
pay attention to four things. Attention, list, be a good listener. Affection, let them know you care. Affection, uh, that's affection. Appreciation, notice the strength and the beauty that everyone brings with their talents. And finally, acceptance. Don't try to change other people. It's hard enough for us to change ourselves. So why do we want to change other people so we can be happy? Focus on your own fulfillment. But that's the happiness formula. The last part, V, voluntary choices, about 40% of our daily happiness experience. Thank you. I have uh, another question from the audience. We are continuously being warned about a second coronavirus wave. How can we be prepared for it in case it happened, especially that life is almost back to normal in many nations? How can we be aware and conscious to avoid depression, anxiety, and confusion? So that's a very complicated answer to that. And it's the simple answer, but what we can do is improve the ecosystem within our body and pay attention to the ecosystem outside. They mirror each other. So right now, if there was one thing that the world needs to focus on, it would be climate change. But it's related to everything else. Mass migrations, violence, everything else I've told, said, is actually climate change is the number one issue. Now, will we go back? Yes, we will go back if the mutation cools down. And the mutation will cool down if we fix the ecosystem. That's my thing. Now, having said that, there are technologies that actually I'm working with. Uh, happy to introduce you to some very people who are actually working right now on what is called particulate-free environments. So you can create a particulate-free environment in your home or in an office or in a movie theater or in a lecture room or anywhere because most 95% of the time we spend indoors, even when there was no pandemic, 90% either in the office or in the theater or wherever. It is possible to create COVID free environments through various uh, technologies, including ultraviolet and many other ways. The virus is carried through particulate matter. In fact, even wind currents can carry the virus from New York to Europe. This, you know, all this thing, travel, etc., which is very good, travel restrictions, but wind currents can carry the particulate matter. Uh, and so, you know, that's not a solution. The solution is how do you first mitigate the virulence of the virus? Secondly, how can we make indoor environments COVID-free? Right now, indoor environments before the COVID epidemic were actually more toxic than the outdoor environments because of all kinds of, you know, recycling of air, this, that particulate matter. So there's a lot of interesting opportunities in the last 100 years. Every time there's been a pandemic or a financial crisis, new technologies have emerged. So AM radio came after First World War. The television came after the Second World War. Uh, the internet came of the 1988 crisis and also a lot of other situations in the world. 2000, we had the mobile phone. Then we had smartphones. Now we have this technology, VR, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, deep learning. And this will now lead to technologies for COVID-free environments. I guarantee you that's going to happen. I, I find it uh, interesting that you would say that because I was just reading something today that because we're learning more and more about how COVID is transmitted. And it's actually not from some jogger breathing on you in the outdoor air. It's actually from indoor environments, either when you go to a restaurant and you stay there for a long time or your workspace. So um, that's, that's extremely beneficial. So to know. Very important question that you raise because you know, have you, ever, uh, have you ever detected the smoke of somebody who's 30 yards away or 100 yards? Away? Well, you're inhaling particulate matter coming from that lung. Six feet is not enough, theoretically for particulate matter. The only place to create indoors is a COVID-free environment and technologies are coming to that. Well, I could have stayed here for another hour. Unfortunately, we are out of time, although there are so many other questions. Um, Dr. Chopra, it's been an absolute pleasure. We've learned so much from you, not just uh, from a medical standpoint or an integrative medical standpoint, but also, how as 
people. We can heal both ourselves and the world. I know you don't like to say environment, but our extension or the, the outdoor uh, world. And our planetary microbiome, our planetary existence. Thank you. I just wanted to say, if I could have one or two just closing remarks from you, I'm sure the audience would appreciate it. And thank you for your time. And by the way, I remember listening to you a long time ago when you said, things don't happen for not, uh, for everything happens for a reason. And we're more connected than we are. My daughter is currently studying at UCSD. So when you mentioned uh, scripts. Right here. Yeah. So when, when things cool down, we should all meet. I hope so. Thank you so much for your time. It is greatly appreciated by me, Dubai's World Government Summit, and my audience. I'm sure this was really fabulous. And thank you very much. The so last comment, you said one thing. Yes. Love in action. Love without action is meaningless. Action without love is irrelevant. Love in action. Together, we can change the world. Inshallah. I hope Inshallah. so. <laughs> thank you very much. Over Thank to you, you Reem. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lamise. Thank you, um, Dr. Deepak. It's been a real pleasure um, really hearing all these different insights. And I think uh, everyone's been emotionally charged during these times. And I think coming together and really seeing not only on an individual level, but how can we actually promote a positivity, acceptance, the feeling of fulfillment broader from just ourselves to the people around us and that even through this COVID-19 pandemic, even though we're connected via virtually right now, that we're all connected collectively together. Um, even the way we need to redesign the way we deal with people and the new technology, the Dr. Deepak that you were mentioning and how this is going to be the future, but how we also need to collectively think of how we can all collectively go together on this journey into the future and be connected uh, positively and impact uh, everyone around us in the most beautiful way possible. Thank you, Dr. Lamis. Thank you, Dr. Chopra. It's been a true pleasure. Um, hopefully, we all see each other soon in person. I wish you all to stay safe. And thank you to the audience for all the lovely questions that have come in today. It's been a really interactive session. Thank you so much and stay safe.